Hello and welcome to Prof. Dale's property video number 31. I'm your host, Dale Whitman. In this video, we're going to learn about the rules for covenants to run with the land at law. By at law, we mean situations in which the plaintiff is seeking money damages as a remedy. Now, when you get a covenant question, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what remedy does the plaintiff want? That might not seem very important, but it's a critical question to knowing which set of legal rules to apply. To enforce a covenant, the plaintiff might want either of two common remedies. The first of those remedies is the remedy at law, namely damages. In other words, the plaintiff wants to get the defendant to pay for the harm that the violation of the covenant has caused. The other common remedy is the equitable remedy of an injunction. In an injunction, the court orders the defendant to stop violating the covenant. Now, it turns out the legal requirements are different depending on whether the remedy at law damages or the remedy in equity an injunction is sought. So you have to know what remedy the plaintiff wants in order to know which set of legal rules to apply. In the real world, most of the time, plaintiffs prefer injunctions. They're not so interested in money damages. They want to get the defendant to stop violating the covenant. But in this video, our concern is about the rules for covenants to run at law, or in other words, the rules that apply when the plaintiff wants money damages. Now, it turns out that there are four rules that have to be satisfied for covenants to run at law when the plaintiff wants money damages as a remedy. These rules are technical and complicated, but if we break them down, they're not hard to understand. The first one is that there must be intent for the covenant to run with the land. Usually, we find an expression of that intent in the wording of the original covenant itself. But even if that wording isn't there, the courts will often presume that the intent for the covenant to run with the land is present if the other three rules are satisfied. The second requirement is that the covenant must touch and concern the land. And we'll talk about that in more detail, but essentially what it means is the covenant has to have something to do with the real estate. The third requirement is horizontal and vertical privity of estate. Now, this is purely a technical requirement. It's hard to find any policy rationale for it at all. It goes back to the old English common law, but it's still very much with us today. So we've got to find both horizontal and vertical privity of estate. We'll talk in a minute in the next uh, part of this video about what we mean by those terms. One note we might put in here is that horizontal privity isn't required in order to make the benefit run with the benefited land. But both horizontal and vertical privity are required to make the burden run with the burdened land. The final requirement is not really part of covenant law at all. It's part of the Recording Act, which every jurisdiction in America has. And nearly all of those jurisdictions say that notice of the covenant to the burdened party at the time he or she acquires the land is essential to making the burden run to the burdened party and actually burden them and require them to comply with the covenant. Now, if you think about that, you might say, well, that's a pretty reasonable requirement. After all, it would be a dirty trick to impose a covenant on somebody that didn't know about the covenant at the time they acquired their interest in the land. That rule, as I said, is a consequence of the recording acts, which very much definitely do apply to covenants running with the land. So what we're saying then is that a BFP, a bona fide purchaser of the burdened land, will usually take it free of the burden of the covenant. If you don't know about it, you don't have to comply with it. Now, we're going to take each of those four rules and break it down and talk about it in detail. And the first of the rules, as we mentioned, is there must be intent for the benefits and the burdens of the covenant to run with the land. What do we mean by that intent? So how do we show the intent for the benefit and the burden of the covenant to run with the land? Well, the most common way is simply to look at the language of the original covenant. And particularly, if it was drafted by a lawyer, it will usually have language in it that looks something like this. This covenant 
shall bind and benefit the heirs, successors, and assigns of the original parties here too. Now don't be put off by that somewhat archaic language about heirs, successors, and assigns. That's just a fancy way of saying the future owners of the parcels of land affected, the people who take their land from the original parties to the covenant. You'll notice that this boilerplate language refers to both the burdens and the benefits of the covenant because it says the covenant shall bind and benefit. So both the burdens and the benefits are intended, according to this language, to run to the future owners of the respective burdened and benefited parcels of land. Now that language makes it absolutely clear that the intent is present. However, even if that language isn't in the covenant, the courts are usually willing to presume that the intent is satisfied if the next test, the one we're about to talk about, the touch and concern requirement, is satisfied. So even without the boilerplate language, the court may very well find the intent that we need. Let's pin down the intent requirement with a little greater precision. Drafters of covenants nearly always identify the burdened land. They say, the following described land shall be restricted by this covenant in the following way. But often they forget to identify the benefited land. They sort of leave that for us to guess about. So the question arises, does the covenant have to express specifically the identified benefited land, or is it okay to just have a general expression of intent for the benefit to run? Well, it turns out that the courts will usually try to figure out what land was benefited, even if it's not specifically identified. So specifically identifying the benefited land sometimes isn't strictly necessary. Usually, if the courts do that, They'll look at the land the benefited party still owns that's near to the burdened land, and they'll say, well, that must be the land that was intended to be benefited. But relying upon the courts to do that is kind of a sloppy practice. The best drafting practice is always to identify the benefited land as well as the burdened land. So please keep that in mind when you're drafting a covenant in the real world. Identify both the benefited and the burdened land. The burdened land is easy. The benefited land is easy to forget. Why is it so helpful to identify the benefited land? Well, the reason is that if we don't know which land is benefited and we represent the burdened owner, and supposedly we want to negotiate with somebody to terminate the covenant. We want to say to somebody, well, what would you take? How much money in order to relieve us of this covenant? But if we don't know who the owner of the benefited land is, how do we know who to negotiate with? It leaves us in an extremely awkward position. So that's why it's so helpful to identify what the benefited land is. Now, suppose there isn't any benefited land. The benefited party is a person or an entity, a corporation or an LLC or something of that sort, but they don't happen to own any nearby land at all. Can there still be a valid covenant? Well, there can be, and we call that a covenant in gross. The term in gross simply means we have a covenant that doesn't have any specific benefited land. Will the burden still run with the burdened land even if there's no benefited land? Well, that's an interesting question and one on which the courts have split. In England, the answer is no. If you don't have benefited land, for the benefit to run with, then the burden won't run with the burdened land either. The American courts are about equally divided on that question. If we read the servitude's restatement, it says that the running of the burden of covenants, even though the covenant is in gross and doesn't have any benefited land, is perfectly fine. It's okay. So according to the restatement, this is not an issue that we really have to worry about. If we want to diagram the covenant in gross situation, it would look something like this. A normal, a pertinent covenant, that is one that has benefited land, involves a covenant from the owner of the burdened land to the owner of the benefited land. No surprise there. On the other hand, a covenant in gross looks more like this. There's an owner of the burdened land who makes a covenant that affects certain benefited persons. It gives them a promise that they like and appreciate and want to receive, 
but they don't have any particular benefited land. They don't have any land near the covenant. Let's think about some examples of covenants in gross. Covenants in gross, those that are only involving burdened land and have no benefited land, can still be extremely useful. For example, think about a historic preservation covenant. Let's suppose that we have a city or a town that has some beautiful old historic buildings in it. And there's a citizens group that's interested in preserving the history of the town. So they go to the owner of one of these historic buildings and they say, would you give us a covenant that you'll maintain the appearance, the facade, the attributes of this building so that its historic nature will always be obvious. Now we, the group that's asking you to do this, don't happen to own any real estate. So we have here a covenant with burdened land, the historic building, but no particular benefited land. Once again, the restatement says that's perfectly okay, but the American courts generally in the past have split as to whether that's permissible or not. The same is true of a land conservation covenant. Let's suppose a conservation group goes to a farmer and says, we would like to have you promise, and we'll pay you for the promise, that you'll only use your land for agricultural purposes, that it won't be built on, have subdivisions or apartments or other properties like that placed on it for, let's say, the next 50 or 100 years. That's a conservation covenant. If the group to whom the promise is made doesn't have any real estate nearby, that's a covenant in gross. And yet you can see that it could be a very useful kind of covenant. A third example is an environmental cleanup covenant with a government agency. The agency comes to a landowner whose land is contaminated with hazardous materials. And they say, will you enter into a covenant with us to clean up that land? And naturally, we would like to have the burden of that covenant run with the land. So if you sell or give the land to somebody else, they're still going to be bound by the covenant. Now, we as the government don't happen to own any nearby benefited land, but nevertheless, we think the burden ought to run with the burdened land. Again, the restatement would say that's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that. In the past, the American courts have had a hard time and have come out on both sides of that issue as to whether the burden will run if there's no benefited land for the benefit to run with. Now, the second requirement for a covenant to run with the land is that it has to touch and concern the land. Touch and concern means the covenant's got to have something to do with the real estate. Obviously, a parcel of real estate can't make a covenant. Covenants are made by human beings. But the covenant must bind and benefit the parties in their capacity as landowners and not merely in their capacity as individuals. In other words, they wouldn't be making this covenant if they didn't own the land in question, and the covenant has something to do with the land. Many of the courts say that the covenant has to touch and concern both the benefited land and the burdened land, since there are always at least two parcels involved in a covenant. Obviously, if we have a covenant in gross, it doesn't touch and concern the benefited land because there isn't any benefited land. So for that reason, as we mentioned a little earlier, the American courts have divided as to whether the burden will run with the burdened land if there is no benefited land. Now, here are a couple of questions about touching and concerning the land. The first one is, could a covenant touch and concern the land even though it doesn't restrict the use of the land? In other words, do covenants have to be restrictive covenants in order to touch and concern the land? And the answer is, no, they don't. One of the most common examples is a covenant by individual lot or homeowners to pay dues to an owner's association. The dues are normally used to maintain the common areas of the association. And the courts in America have universally held that a covenant to pay dues for that purpose does touch and concern the land, even though it obviously isn't a use covenant, it's a covenant to pay money. An alternative question is, could a covenant restrict the use of the land and still not touch and concern the land? Well, the answer is that that's entirely possible, and one way it can happen is represented by the Stigall case decided by the North Carolina Supreme Court in 1971, 
The benefited land, in that case, the court said, was several miles away from the burdened land. It was too far away to receive any practical benefit from the covenant. So the court held that the benefited land, uh, the covenant did not touch and concern it because it was so far away. And therefore, since the covenant didn't touch and concern both benefited and burdened land, the covenant wouldn't run with the burdened land either. So we've got to show, in order to have touch and concern, that the parcels that are benefited and burdened are reasonably close to one another so that restricting or affecting the burdened parcel will have some benefit to the benefited parcel. Now here are some questions that are sort of classic issues about whether a covenant touches and concerns the land. The first one is the old English case of Keppel versus Bailey. In that case, the covenant said that a, an owner of an ironworks, an iron factory, which needed lime to operate, would only buy lime from a particular nearby lime pit to make the iron on the burdened land. So the question was, if a new owner bought the ironworks, would they also have to buy lime from that same lime pit? Would they be bound by that covenant? The court held that they would not. They said that a covenant to buy lime from a particular lime pit doesn't touch and concern the land. Obviously, a covenant to use lime or to run the ironworks in a particular way would touch and concern the land, but the burdened land really wasn't affected in the slightest by where the lime came from. So whether the lime was bought from this lime pit or some other really wouldn't make any difference in terms of what happened on the burdened land, and therefore the covenant did not touch and concern the land. A little more modern example of that is the Braemar case. That's a Washington state case where an owner of land was expecting to grade it in the future and entered into a covenant with a contractor that the landowner would use that specific contractor for grading the land when it was time to do the grading. Later on, the land was, before it was graded, sold to a different owner and the different owner didn't want to go to the same grading contractor. The question was whether they had a legal obligation to do so. And the answer is much like Kevel versus Bailey. The court said, yes, a covenant to grade the land would touch and concern the land, but a covenant to use a particular contractor for grading it really would have no bearing on what happened on the land itself and therefore did not touch and concern the land. So the new landowner didn't have to go back to that same contractor to get the grading work done. There have been quite a lot of cases in America over the last hundred years or so about covenants not to use property for certain specific businesses. For example, a covenant not to use land for a discount store, not to use it for a livery stable, um, an abattoir, any kind of undesirable use that you might want to imagine. Does that sort of covenant touch and concern the land? Well, the cases are split on it, but nearly all of the recent cases say that it does. In other words, some of the older cases said, well, it's just a covenant about the type of business that will be run on the land and not on the fundamental use of the land itself. But more recent cases have said, no, the type of business is the use of the land Therefore, a restriction on the type of business will touch and concern the land. Here are some of the tests that have been proposed for covenants to touch and concern the land. Does the covenant make the benefited land more valuable and the burdened land less valuable? If it does, then that's an indication that the covenant touches and concerns the land. Do the covenants control negative externalities? That is, do they restrict the land in ways that will benefit other land by preventing obnoxious or undesirable uses of the burdened land. Once again, that's an indicator that the covenant does touch and concern the land. Now, the third requirement for a covenant to run with the land at law is privity of estate. And there are two kinds of privity, horizontal and vertical. We're going to take a close look at each one of them and see what they mean. Before we do, I want to caution you that these are strictly technical requirements. They don't really make any policy sense at all, and if you try to impute some policy rationale to them, you're likely to just be frustrated. So the point is simply to learn the rules and apply them, because that's what the courts do.
The first kind of privity we're going to look at is horizontal privity, and there are four different views in the courts about what horizontal privity means. Before we look at them, let me emphasize that horizontal privity is a relationship between the original parties to the covenants. In other words, either privity uh, in the horizontal sense exists or doesn't exist the moment the covenant is entered into. It isn't something that can be created later because it's a relationship between the original parties. Now, the oldest and most traditional view of horizontal privity is that it's a landlord-tenant relationship. And that's certainly still true today, but it's not very relevant to our present discussion because we're talking about owners of fee simple interests in land who enter into covenants with each other, not people who are landlord and tenant in their relationship with one another. But that is still a perfectly valid view of horizontal privity, just not one that helps us right now. The second kind of privity we need to talk about is simultaneous interests in the same land. Now, remember, we're talking about the two parties to the original covenant. So in a simultaneous interest privity case, one of the parties has an interest in the land of the other party. And the most common example of that is that one of the parties owns a piece of land and the other has an easement on that land. And then they enter into a covenant that concerns that easement. It's about the easement. For example, the covenant says who will repair and maintain the easement or how it will be used. So those are simultaneous interests in the same land. Once again, the courts almost always will recognize that as a valid form of horizontal privity. Now, the third kind of horizontal privity is one that is very widely accepted as well. And I like to call it instantaneous privity. What that means is that the covenant is either in or it's executed simultaneously with a deed of one of the parcels of land. It could be either the benefited parcel or the burdened parcel. So in other words, one of the parties is transferring some land to the other and they put the covenant in the deed or they enter into the covenant at the same time the deed is delivered. That will be a form of horizontal privity. The final view is only a small minority view, but it is adopted by the restatement of servitude, so the chances are it will grow over time, and that is that this is all a lot of nonsense, that horizontal privity isn't really necessary at all, and we're wasting our time to even think or talk about it. But as I say, not many courts have accepted that view so far. Now here's an example to help us understand what horizontal privity means. Let's suppose we have two parcels of land side by side, one owned by A and the other by B. So the parties are neighbors and they don't have any other relationship. You'll notice that neither party is selling land to the other party. They both already own their parcels of land. Now they enter into a covenant. B promises A that B won't keep any pigs on B's lot. So we'd say that B has the burdened land and A has the benefited land. Then B sells B's lot to B2, and B2 puts some pigs on the lot that was formerly owned by B. So the issue before us is whether the burden of this covenant runs with the burdened land when the burdened land is transferred. In order for that to happen, we have to show that there's horizontal privity. Can A recover damages from B2? Well, only if horizontal privity exists. And sad to say, there is no horizontal privity. Now let's think a minute about why that's true. On the previous slide, we looked at the definition of horizontal privity, and there are four variations on that. First, the landlord-tenant relationship, and we obviously don't have that between A and B. Second, simultaneous interests in the same land, but neither A nor B has any interest in the other's land. So that definition of horizontal privity won't work. The third definition is that the parties uh, enter into the covenant simultaneously with a deed of one of the parcels of land. It could be either the benefited or the burdened parcel. But in this case, neither party is deeding any land to the other party at all. Neither parcel of land is subject to a deed. The covenant is a sort of freestanding covenant. It's entered into without reference to any deed of any parcel of the land. So the bottom line is there is no horizontal privity here. Therefore, the burden of the covenant won't run with the burdened land in an action at law. So if 
B, B2 puts pigs on the property and A sues B2, A's suit for damages will fail because of the lack of horizontal privity. Incidentally, horizontal privity isn't necessary to make the benefit run with the benefited land. Now, in this case that we've been talking about, the running of the benefit's not an issue because A still has the original benefited land. But if A transferred the land, the new owner of A's land could enforce the covenant against B, not against B2, but against B, because horizontal privity isn't required for the benefit to run, only for the burden to run with the burdened land. Now a few words about vertical privity. Vertical privity is not a relationship between the original parties to the covenant. Instead, what's required for vertical privity is that the full estate of each original party to the covenant has to be transferred to the new party. Vertical privity means the full estate is transferred when there's a transfer of either the benefited or the burdened land. It's analogous, if you remember our discussion about assignments and subleases in landlord-tenant law, it's analogous to an assignment rather than a sublease. Indeed, that's one of the ways that we describe the difference between an, a, an assignment and a sublease. That is, an assignment involves full vertical privity, a transfer of the entire interest of the original party to the new party. So that's what we mean by vertical privity in the uh, fee simple context, just like in the landlord tenant context. Now in the vast majority of cases, vertical privity is easily satisfied. That's what the parties do. They enter into a covenant, and then they sell their entire interest in the parcel. So there's no problem, no issue with vertical privity in a case like that. Now, while vertical privity issues aren't very common, there are some situations in which lack of vertical privity can prove to be an issue. The first of those is where one of the parties to the covenant, after entering into the covenant, transfers less than a full fee simple interest in their land. It isn't very common, but it is possible. For example, one of the parties who owns the land in fee simple and enters into a covenant might then give someone else a life estate interest in it or a leasehold estate interest. Well, obviously, in a strict sense, that's not vertical privity because it's not a transfer of the entire interest that the original party to the covenant held. A second possibility is that after the covenant is entered into, one of the parcels of land is taken by an adverse possessor. The reason that's an issue is that literally adverse possession doesn't involve a transfer of an interest in the land. Instead, in an adverse possession case, the original party's ownership of the land is simply terminated, and in theory, the adverse possessor gets a brand new fee simple title to the land. So literally, there is no transfer from the original party to the adverse possessor, and therefore, arguably, no vertical privity. A third situation is what we might call on the benefit side a third party beneficiary. Now this would involve some language in the original covenant that says this covenant is not only for the benefit of the party who is presently entering into the covenant as the benefited owner of land, but it's also for the benefit of somebody else, somebody who's not presently a party to the covenant, but who owns some other nearby land that would be benefited by the covenant. Now, obviously, it's possible to do that, to name a third-party beneficiary in the covenant. But from the point of view of the third-party beneficiary, of course, there's no vertical privity because there's no transfer of any interest in the land to that party at all. They already own the other nearby land. So in all three of these situations, it's certainly possible to argue that there is no vertical privity and therefore that the covenant won't run with the land because of the lack of that vertical privity. We need to wind up our discussion of privity of estate by talking about when it's important. And the first thing to know is it's important only in an action at law for damages. If we have an action in equity for an injunction, we don't need privity at all. Neither horizontal nor vertical privity is even discussed, even thought about in a case in equity. So it's only at law that we need to be concerned about it. So remember, we always need to look at the remedy the plaintiff is seeking 
and see if it's the legal remedy of damages or the equitable remedy of an injunction. The second thing we need to say, and this is just a little reminder, horizontal privity is required only if we need to make the burden run with the burden land. Horizontal privity isn't necessary to make the benefit run with the benefited land. So as we talked about in the previous slideshow, in every covenant case, we need to analyze the facts and see if we need to make the benefit run or the burden run or both. If we do need to make the burden run, then at law we're going to need horizontal privity. If we only have a case in which the benefited land has been transferred and the burden land hasn't been transferred, we don't have to worry about horizontal privity at all. The third point to make is that vertical privity is required to make both the benefit and the burden run. But often in cases where it's the benefit running, the courts will take a relaxed view of vertical privity. They won't be strict about it. And instead of saying, well, you have to have a total transfer of the original party's entire interest to have vertical privity, they might say, well, a transfer of some lesser interest will also work. So perhaps a court on the benefit side would count a transfer of a life estate or a transfer of a lease estate as being good enough to be vertical privity. Now, the fourth and final requirement for a covenant to run with the land at law is notice to the burden party. And this is a requirement that doesn't literally come from covenant law. It comes from the Recording Act, and every state in America has a Recording Act. Now, we haven't studied Recording Acts yet in this series of videos, but here's a little preview of the way it would work. First of all, we have to recognize that it would be a terribly unfair thing to do, a sort of dirty trick, if we were to impose a burden of a covenant on somebody when they bought the land without any way of knowing about the covenant at the time they purchased it. So the point is, we're looking for notice to them at the time they buy the land. Notice that there is a covenant that restricts it. Remember, we're only talking about the burden party because it's the burden party who would be disadvantaged if they bought the land without knowing about the covenant. Now, under the recording acts in most of the U.S. states, the rules are like this. A buyer will take free of the burden of a prior covenant if, first of all, the covenant itself wasn't recorded in the public records. If the covenant is recorded in the public records, then anybody who buys the land later will be deemed to have done a title search and thereby will be deemed to have notice of the covenant. So the first element in this little scenario is that the covenant itself wasn't immediately recorded in the public records when it was entered into. Second, the recording acts say that for a buyer to take free of the covenant, the later buyer must pay value for the land. They have to give something of value for it. Third, they must not have, as we said, have had any notice of the covenant at the time they purchased it. And in half the states, the recording acts all say that also say that the buyer has to immediately record his or her own deed to the land. Well, if all those elements are met, we call the person who is buying the land subject to the covenant, the burdened land, we call them a BFP, a bona fide purchaser. And such a person will take free of the covenant. They can disregard it. They can act as if it's not there. They can't be sued for violating it. They are basically cleansing their title of the covenant that was originally placed on the land. So to be a bona fide purchaser, a party who buys some burdened land mustn't have any notice of the covenant. So how could a person get notice that there's a covenant on the land that they're buying? Well, there are basically three ways that that could happen. The first way is simply that they have actual knowledge of the covenant because somebody tells about them about it or they read about it in the newspaper or there's a sign on the property that says this is land is restricted by the following covenant, something that they actually see or read or hear that tells them about the covenant. That's pretty obvious. The second way that a person can find out about a covenant is if the covenant is recorded in the public records. So as we said on the previous slide, a person can become a bona fide purchaser of the land only if the covenant was not recorded immediately in the public records when it was entered into. Now, the third way that a person might learn about a covenant on land that they're buying is that it's apparent from looking at the land, from the visual appearance of the land. 
Uh, frankly, this theory is controversial. How could you learn about a covenant just by looking at the land that is burdened by it? Well, here's an example. Let's suppose that we have a subdivision of lots and all of the lots in the subdivision are built with single family detached houses. Some courts have been willing to say, if that's the case, then anybody who buys the land and sees the existing single family houses ought to reason, ought to infer that those lots are all restricted by a covenant limiting the property to single family detached houses. Now, obviously, if you believe that, you mustn't stretch it very far because you can easily think of situations where you could see something and yet it doesn't indicate the presence of a covenant at all. Suppose, for example, that we have a subdivision in which all of the houses have no satellite dishes or TV antennas on them. Would we be able to infer from that that there's a covenant prohibiting satellite dishes or TV antennas? Or suppose we look around the subdivision and we don't see any recreational vehicles in the driveways or the garages. Would that indicate to us that there's a covenant restricting the use of or storage of recreational vehicles uh, in people's garages or driveways? Well, if you think about those propositions, you'll realize they're absurd. You can't infer that simply from the absence of something in the subdivision. Well, the courts have been willing to go this far to say that if it's built with single family houses, you can infer there's a covenant that tells you you can't put anything other than a single family house on, uh, on a lot in the subdivision. I think even that is stretching it, but the courts have gone that far. Beyond that, the courts simply generally will not go. So looking at the land and detecting that there's a covenant on it can be a very iffy and perilous business. Well, we finished our discussion of the rules for running covenants at law. Here's a little summary to remind you of what all, the, all four of the rules are. The first one is there must be intent for the covenant to run, something that we'd normally find by reading the covenant itself. But even if it doesn't mention any such intent, the courts will often infer that intent if the other requirements are met. The second requirement is that the covenant's got to touch and concern the land. That is, it must have something to do with the real estate itself. The third requirement is horizontal and vertical privity of estate. As we've indicated, horizontal privity isn't required in order for the benefit to run. In theory, both horizontal and vertical privity are required for the burden to run. And finally, we've got to have notice of the covenant to the burden party. That requirement arises by virtue of the recording acts. So if the covenant is unrecorded, and a person who buys the burdened land is a bona fide purchaser, a BFP, and in half the states they record their own deed, they will take free of the covenant. Well, that completes Prof. Dale's property video number 31 about the rules for covenants to run with the land at law. In our next video, we're going to cover running with the land in equity, where the plaintiff wants an injunction rather than money damages as a remedy. If you have questions or comments, email propdale01 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.